I was sitting in my house one day talking with my wife when all of a sudden. Honey, I've been thinking and I would really like a new dining room table. Um, yeah, I can definitely do that. It's kind of what I do. And I would really love for it to be out of reclaimed wood, like really old wood that has a story and stuff. You don't want reclaimed wood. It's got a ton of cracks in it. Uh-huh. Lots of times bugs have been eating on it. Okay. It's got nails in it. They destroy your equipment. Yeah. It's usually got holes in it and stains and mystery spots that you don't know what they are. Ooh. Reclaimed wood is really hard to find. I mean, that comes from old buildings and you can't just go tear down an old building. Ah. It's hard to tell what type of wood it is because it's covered in dirt and dust, so you don't really know what you're working with until you start cutting into it. Uh-huh. When you do cut into it, it's like a fresh, clean saw mark that doesn't match the rest of the wood, so how do you make that look rustic like the rest of the wood? Yeah, perfect. Reclaimed wood it is. Oh boy. Here we go. Now the first hurdle in building anything out of reclaimed wood is, well, finding the reclaimed wood. Lucky for me, my wife found this architectural salvage place in Aurora, Oregon. They had all sorts of stuff, including a pretty healthy supply of reclaimed and salvaged lumber. So after digging through their large supply of mismatched boards, with the help of Craig, of course, I managed to find a pile of dirty, disgusting boards that somehow I'm going to turn into a table. On the upside, I did only spend $300 on materials. After bringing all the wood back to my shop and letting it acclimate for a few days just so that it was the same moisture content as my shop, it was time to get to work. Now the first thing you need to do when you're making any reclaimed furniture is get a whole bunch of MDF. You see, the problem with building anything out of reclaimed lumber is that once you cut into it, you lose that patina, that rustic nature, that aesthetic that everyone likes so much. So you gotta figure out a way to keep that patina and not show the just raw natural wood underneath. So instead of trying to make table legs completely out of the reclaimed lumber, I decided I will make my legs out of MDF, and then the plan is to just veneer them in skins that I cut from the reclaimed lumber. Now I should say that I've never done this before, and the idea just kind of came to me while I was driving home from the salvage yard, so I'm not sure if this will work or not. But first things first, I needed to glue up a bunch of blanks of MDF. So after cutting all my strips on the table saw, I smeared a bunch of glue in between them, and I got to work. I did one set with two legs, and then I did another set with three legs. Now before you say, hey wait, that makes five legs, what kind of table are you making, mister? As I already mentioned, I've never done this before, so I thought it was a good idea to have one extra leg, just in case I screw up. Did you know that scraped up glue looks just like cheddar cheese? It does not taste like it though. Plech. Once my leg blanks were all glued together, I took them out of clamps, and now it was time to mill up this MDF. Can you mill up MDF? Who knows? I'm gonna try. Now I'm sure this is terrible for my equipment because MDF is really hard and full of all sorts of glues and resins, but I had to get these legs square somehow. So after running them through the joiner, I took them over to the planer and I planed them down to my final thickness which if I remember correct was around three and a half inches, three and three quarter, somewhere in there. Then I cut the ends so they were nice and flush. Now, I didn't want to just make square legs. That seemed boring. I wanted it to be a little fancier. I mean, if I'm gonna do a thing, I'm gonna do a thing. So I thought tapered legs might look nice. So the first thing I have to do is create some sort of jig so I can cut repeated tapers on all the legs. So I used a ruler to draw a taper until I got the shape that I was looking for. I added some double-sided tape and then I stuck on a piece of plywood, making sure the edge of the plywood was right on my pencil line. 
and I flipped the whole thing over. To make sure that this cut was repeatable, I had to create some sort of stop on my plywood so that my other legs, once I set them in there, will be cut exactly the same as my first leg. So I used a little CA glue and some scrap pieces of plywood. I put a little scrap on the side, I put a little scrap on the top, and now I should be able to just grab a leg, shove it in there, and run it through the table saw. You can see I'm using that scrap piece of plywood to run along the fence of my saw, and my leg gets a nice taper cut on it. Well, kind of. You might also see that my saw blade is not tall enough to cut all the way through my MDF blank. But don't worry, I have a plan. After cutting a taper on one side, I rotated the leg around, and I did the exact same thing on the other side. Now I'm only going to taper two of my four sides, because I like the way that looks. I think it'll be nice to have a perfectly straight edge down the outside corner of each leg. So after cutting a taper on those two sides, I took the leg over to the bandsaw and I trimmed off the fat. Now I didn't cut perfectly flush with my leg, I trimmed it a little bit proud so that I could clean it up over on the router table. Using my initial cut from the table saw, kind of like a template, I took the leg over to the router table and using a flush trim compression bit, I flushed up all the spots I wasn't able to reach on the table saw. Pretty soon I had a beautiful tapered leg made out of gorgeous MDF. Don't worry, this will get better. With one leg done, I did the exact same thing on the remaining four legs. Because remember, I made one extra, just in case I screw up somewhere, which I haven't so far. Knock on MDF. Once I had all the legs shaped, it was time to start figuring out my veneer from this reclaimed lumber. Now these boards look pretty rough. So the real trick is gonna be to mill these boards down to a point that they're not splinter hazards, yet keeping that vintage patina that my wife is looking for. AKA years of dirt, grime, and who knows what else. So after cutting a bunch of boards roughly to size, I took them over to my bandsaw and I re-sawed them right down the middle. My goal is to make these veneers as slim as I possibly can. My thought being that it'll hide the amount of seams that you'll see if you're just dealing with a thin eighth or sixteenth of an inch thick veneer. So after resawing all the boards in half, which, believe me, took a long time and cost me a bandsaw blade, because, well, I missed a few nails. They're hard to see. The boards are all dirty. I took all the boards over to the planer and I started running them through to bring the thickness down even more. Now the planer will only do so much. I can only get it to, oh, about an eighth of an inch. So after the planer, I had to go over to the drum sander. And if you've ever used a drum sander, you know it's not quick. But eventually I got all of my skins planed and sanded down to right around an eighth of an inch, maybe. I mean, they might be a little thicker. I got impatient with the drum sander. Now the trick is, how do we cover these now tapered blanks of MDF with reclaimed wood, but do it in a way that it's not obvious that we just covered up a bunch of MDF with reclaimed wood? The main problem with this is that I wasn't able to get all matching boards. They were all a little bit different. But I was able to have enough matching boards that I could separate out one board that matched per pile. So basically I had four matching boards and then I divvied them out. So I had four separate piles, one for each leg. And in each one of those piles, well, I had four random boards, but they matched with the other piles, if that makes any sense at all. Hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense here in a second. Next, I put my MDF blanks together in the orientation that they would be once I build out my table base. And using four different colored markers, I marked all of the sides with different colors, but all the sides matched. So all the outside edges were green, and all the other outside edges were blue, and then the inside edges were black, and then the other inside edges were pink. Is this making sense yet? And then I also marked the sides of the legs so I wouldn't get confused. But somehow I'm still confused. Basically I color coded the legs different color on each side. Then I went back over to my piles of veneer. And taking the four veneer pieces that matched the best, I color-coded those with the same color. So I'd have four blue, 
and then I'd have four green, and I'd have four pink, and all the pinks kind of matched, and all the greens kind of matched, and all the blues kind of matched, and all the blacks kind of matched, and so on and so forth. Now I have a way to pair up my veneers with each side of my legs so that they should all somewhat look the same, even though they're not. But I think this will work, but I really don't know. The other problem was that now that I tapered the legs, I had this nice little angle to deal with because it wasn't a taper from top all the way to the bottom. It was a taper from the bottom to part way up and then a flat spot on the top. So I had this whole situation. I thought about this for a long time. Could I steam bend the wood? And that seemed like way too much work for a reclaimed table. So I just measured down the distance from the top of the leg to where that taper started. I measured the same distance onto my reclaimed veneer, and then I figured out the angle that I needed to cut my veneer at to match the angle on the leg. I cut that angle on both the top part of the veneer and the bottom part of the veneer, making sure that my grain would match, and hopefully when I glue these up, it'll follow that angle and it won't be too obvious. So with that figured out, it was time to start hooking the veneers to my MDF legs. For this, I'm going super simple. Just smear on some glue and tack the veneer in place with a 23 gauge brad nailer. The nice thing about the 23 gauge brad nailer is the holes are so small that they're practically invisible, especially in reclaimed wood. The downside is you don't get a lot of holding power but we're not looking for strength, we're just looking for them to hold the veneers in place long enough for the glue to dry. So, I think it'll serve that purpose just fine. I decided to start with the pink side of my leg, so I did all of my pink veneers on all of my legs, and pretty soon I had a bunch of legs that, well, they kinda looked like this. Trust me, I've never done this before. Once I had one side glued on and the glue was dry, I took those legs over to the bandsaw, trimmed off a little bit of the fat, and then went back over to the router table using that same flush trim bit that I got from Bits and Bits, by the way. And I trimmed my first veneer side flush to my MDF blank. And you know, it actually looked pretty good, all things considered. This might just work. In no time, I had all of the pink side trimmed down flush and looking fresh actually looking very very old and it was on to the black side now this is my only other side with the taper on it so this will be the last time that i need to cut this angle i went through the exact same process smeared on a little glue waited for it to dry trim down the fat and then went over to the router table to make everything look pretty now because i was pretty impatient cutting my veneers and i didn't make them super thin there is that exposed edge but I just burned the edge a little bit with a torch and then sanded it down, and it's pretty hard to see. Next, I have to do my final two sides. Now this is the one side with a perfectly straight edge on it, which means we can do a mitered joint along this edge and really make that seam completely invisible. So I took my last two remaining veneers for each leg, I went over to the table saw, and I cut a long 45 degree angle on one side of both veneers. Then I laid down a piece of blue tape, sticky side up, on my workbench, and I stuck my two veneers together with just the tips of that 45 degree angle touching in the middle. Once I had those stuck down, all I needed to do was smear a little glue in my crack, well not, in my crack, the crack of the, the veneers there. If I smeared glue in my crack, well, that would cause some serious problems. Once I had an ample amount of glue on my veneers, I just had to grab my leg and then wrap those veneers around the leg. Now, I did mess up here. I accidentally put the green on the blue and the blue on the green. But luckily, I caught my mistake on this first leg, so I just did the same thing on the remaining legs so that they all matched even though they weren't on the same colors. But that's okay. Pretty soon, all my legs looked like this. A little ridiculous, but you can kind of see where I'm going with this, right? I peeled off my tape once my glue was dry and was very relieved to see I had nice tight miters underneath. Then it was back over to the bandsaw to trim everything up one last time, then over to the router table to make everything look pretty. 
And I never thought I'd say this about reclaimed wood, but I actually enjoyed putting these together. I mean, look at that. Would you be able to tell that these are actually MDF? Probably not. So I don't think my wife will, which is the real important part. It's Christmas time, which means it's time to get out your Christmas decorations, start trimming that tree, and start thinking about what would be a good gift for that loved one in your life, that family member. Well, I don't know about you, but I get weird gifts every year. Socks. I'm always getting socks. I don't need any more socks, yet I get them all the time. But might I encourage you this year to think outside the box of the normal gifts and get something that will really impact your family's future. Like life insurance. I know it seems boring, but wouldn't it be nice to make sure that for Christmas, everyone is taken care of should the worst happen? And that's where Policy Genius comes in. Policy Genius makes it easy to get online and find the right insurance policy for you without all the hassle. If you don't believe me, well, just watch this. Policy Genius knows how valuable your time is. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Their licensed, award-winning agents can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you, not the insurance company, so that means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. It's no wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Now, you might be thinking, all that sounds great, wonderful, but where do I go? How do I sign up? That part's incredibly easy. Just do this. Your family deserves peace of mind, and a life insurance policy through Policy Genius can give it to them. Head to policygenius.com slash bourbon moth or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. With my legs figured out and looking good, it was time to start working on the rest of the table. Because believe it or not, this table is going to consist of more than just four legs. So I grabbed some more reclaimed wood and started cutting down straight pieces that I'm going to use for the base of the table. But before I can start cutting those pieces to length, I have to figure out how big our table's actually going to be. Now our table's going to be made out of those three boards you just saw a second ago. So I measured those up and then I measured the width of two legs pushed together. I pulled out my calculator and I took the total width of my table minus those legs and I accounted for an inch and a half overhang and then I was able to cut all my internal apron pieces. So I just started cutting them and placing them between my legs and other than the fact that it's upside down, it's kind of starting to look like a table. But before I can do anything else, I had to sand and boy do I actually really enjoy sanding reclaimed wood. I never thought I'd say that, but it's fun to just get rid of all that dirt and make the wood say, hey, look at me, I'm under here. And this 3M Cubitron sandpaper did a fantastic job cutting through all those years of grime. However, the sanding took all my burnt marks off of the edges that I had made with that torch. And to be honest, I wasn't completely happy with how that looked anyways, so I did something really crazy. I went out to the garden, I grabbed a handful of dirt, and I just kind of used it as a stain. I rubbed it on all those clean, exposed edges, and they weren't clean anymore. I mean, it really did practically make them disappear. And once I put finish on it, I mean, it's going to seal in the dirt, so it's not going to be all, you know, dirty and icky. With all my pieces sanded down, it was time to start figuring out my joinery. I'll be using the domino joiner to hook my aprons into my legs. So once I had all my apron pieces and legs marked, I grabbed the domino joiner and hip thrust. Hip thrust. Hip thrust. Complete. Just like that, I had all my mortises drilled out on my aprons and my legs. I'm doubling up two 10 millimeter by 100 dominoes in each joint, so that should be plenty strong. I decided to abandon my table base assembly for a little bit and start trying to figure out the top. Now, these boards look pretty nasty and dirty and just genuinely gross. 
They also have a bunch of cracks on the end, but lucky for me they were longer than I needed, so I very carefully tried to cut out all the sections that were cracked beyond repair. I tested this by, you know, trying to break the offcuts, and if those didn't break, well, I thought I was probably okay. Once I had my three boards cut to length, which is eight feet long, it was time to make them look, well, not so icky and gross. So to start, I went over to the planer. Now when you're working with reclaimed wood and you want to keep that, you know, veneer, the best thing to do is to just pick a side. Do all your milling on that side. Yes, they're going to look like fresh, clean boards when you're done, but when you flip them over, you'll still have that nice veneer, or in this case, dirt and broken knot holes on the other side. Yeah, still have a little work to do. It's time to really put this 3M sandpaper to the test. Ah, look at that. The dirt is going away and underneath is actually some pretty nice looking CBG fur. At least I think that's what it is. It could be pine too, but my guess is fur. And look at that sanding pad. After an entire board, it still looks practically new. And look at that transformation. One board sanded, two boards to go. And then well, because this is a YouTube video, I just, now it's two boards sanded, one board to go. Now the last board needed a little repair in the way of some stabilization, in the way of some CA glue. I squirted a bunch of the brown star bond in some of the cracks and around that knot hole. And to be honest, after I sanded it, it looked pretty natural. I mean, it did help that these boards are pretty gnarled to begin with, but for what I'm building, I think it looks good enough. Now before I assemble my table base, I thought it would be a good idea to pre-finish all of my parts. I played around with a couple finishes, I even used some of this bourbon moth beard oil that we sell on our website, and I finally settled on this, Rubio Monocoat Mist. It was the only finish I found that didn't just turn the fur orange. It had a nice natural look with just a hint of color. So I grabbed a leg filled up a little cup of oil and I started rubbing. Now the trick here is to use just a very small amount of oil and really work it into that wood. Just go a little section at a time and work your way down the leg. As you can see, once you start to wipe off that oil, it looks pretty natural. I mean, all things considered. So I just slowly worked my way down the leg buffing it off as much as I could as I went, and this is what I ended up with. That is one side completely oiled. All in all, that still looks pretty darn good. So happy with the color, me and Craig got to work oiling the rest of the legs. Well, and the, the top. We oiled the top too. Well, and the bottom of the top. Anyways, we oiled everything until everything was covered in oil, including ourselves. Let me back up. I don't mean that there was a moment that me and Craig oiled ourselves or each other. We just oiled the wood and happened to get some on ourselves in the process. I just want to be very clear about that. With all of our parts and pieces finished, I let them dry overnight and came out the next day to start assembling the table base. I went really slow and used as little amount of glue as I thought I could get away with because I really didn't want to squeeze out on all those nicely finished parts. Very carefully, I tap-tapped here, and I tap-tapped there, and I tap-tapped everywhere until my base was starting to come together. I clamped up the two end pieces first, then waited for the glue to dry, and then once the glue was dry, I took those out of clamps, and I started putting glue for the, the longer, the longer stretchy pieces, the, um, the aprons, yeah the long aprons. Now this part was a little trickier because the aprons are so long, so I enlisted the help of my good buddy Craig. He helped me fold down one side and hook it into the other side. And then clamping this together was also a bit of a challenge because I didn't have any clamps that were long enough, so we just took two clamps and made them hold hands in the middle. And that was good enough. And because this is a video, boom, the glue's dry. So we took everything out of clamps and it was time to add my last few pieces of bracing on the inside of the base. 
Now, whenever I do tables like this, I like to add this little 45 piece that sandwiches that leg in place. This actually adds a ton of strength to the leg itself, especially if the leg gets hit lower down by a rogue chair or a dog or grandma chucking a bowling ball through the house, anything like that. I literally just cut a piece with two 45s on each end and screw it in place. And then the other thing I like to do is add some stretchers across the middle of the frame to kind of lock everything together and keep it square. So I cut two pieces, I added some pocket holes, I put on a clamp just to hold it in place, and then I added some screws. And boom, our table base was complete. Oh wait, it, it actually wasn't. I also mortised out some little holes with my smaller domino joiner so that I can add some of these. Z-clip fasteners that I will use to hook the tabletop to the table base. Speaking of tabletop, all of our oil was dry and it was time to set the top on the base and hope it looks like my wife wanted it to look. Which, it looks like a really old table, so I think we're on the right track. Next, I just measured all of the overhangs to make sure that they were even, and then I clamped the boards in place so they wouldn't move around while I hooked them to the table base. Now, because I'm using three separate boards that aren't joined together, I'm gonna take these three boards and stick them underneath, screwed to the bottom to hold all the boards together. So I had to crawl under the table, hold the board above my head, and screw it to each one of the boards to tie them all together. This will also help you align the top if you ever remove it and need to set it back on the base. So I added one of those boards in each of those three sections, and while I was down there, I added my Z-clip fasteners, and would you believe it? Just like that, this rustic, reclaimed table is complete. And unless you told somebody, you could never guess that there's some MDF hidden in there somewhere. Hey, look at that. A reclaimed dining room table. I gotta say, as much as I dislike working with reclaimed wood, I do like how this table turned out. It was fun to experiment around with some new techniques, doing the legs with that whole veneered skinned thing. So, yeah, wife's happy and that's all that matters. If you haven't done so already, check the links in the video description for all the products and tools we used in this video, and there's a link to our Patreon page down there. If you want to sign up for weekly, you know, live question and answers, bunch of behind the scenes footage, all that stuff, I'm going to go get a big old roast chicken and eat it at this table. Just seems fitting. <laughs>